Gamerheads Podcast is part of the Little Fellow Media Podcast Network, sponsored by podcast host Budsprout, the easiest podcasting software for hosting, promoting, and tracking your podcast. And welcome to another episode of Gamerheads. My name is Roger, aka Rogue Leader76, and with me are my co-host Blue, aka Writer's View, and my co-host Mike. A.K.A. Pezman Mike. And my co-host Christian. A.K.A. Fulgan. Welcome, and welcome listeners from Spring Hill, Tennessee. The first settlers of Spring Hill arrived in 1808, and the city was established in 1809. And Albert Russell was the first person to build a home on the land that became Spring Hill. I don't think he was listening to our podcast, but... Hmm. <laughs> if he is, then that'd be pretty creepy. That would if be awesome. If he is, then we need to find out what's his secret. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> as long as he's not a zombie, I think we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, still, if he is a zombie, maybe we should make friends with him. Yeah, that's true, too. So that we can be on their side. <laughs> and he could build us a home, too. He could, yeah. That's In right. Spring Hill. Why not? In Spring Hill, yeah. So, welcome, listeners from Spring Hill, Tennessee, and welcome listeners from all over the world, and welcome members of the Gamerhead Nation, and the members of the Gamerhead Nation are Miguel, aka at Sergeant Fit Geek, Tordo, aka JTordo40, and Tim at Great Siaman81, and they support Gamerheads through our Patreon page, and on only for $5 a month, you too can become part of the Gamerheads Nation. The link to the Patreon page is in the show notes, so please consider supporting our podcast, and thank you to all those that have already supported us. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, All right, so we have quite a bit to cover today. We have some news. Uh, We have your listener feedback, games that we're currently playing, but before we get into all that, I do have an icebreaker, and our icebreaker this week is... What is one game that defies, defines, not defies, defines <laughs> your childhood? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so it could be anything like, you know, this is the game that I played the most as a kid. Or it could be this is the game that kind of made me who I am today as a gamer. Um, any of those things would work, I guess, for an answer. So Christian, oh, I'm going to start with you. What is one game that defines your childhood? Well, it's so hard to pick just one because there's so many. I've played so many games as a child. Uh, But I think I'll pick one I haven't talked about yet on the show, and that's Guitar Hero 2. Because I got a PS2 at one point uh, for like Christmas when I was like 11 or something like that. And then uh, I remember, I think it was my 12th birthday... I got Guitar Hero 2 on PS2 with the guitar, and that was crazy. That was before I had a PS2 memory card, and it just blew my mind that I had this guitar peripheral and just licensed to play it as much as I wanted. And so I went off to the races and just played it over and over and over and over. That set list, those songs, still are burned into my brain to this day. So whenever I hear one come on the radio, anyone I'm around will get annoyed because I'll say, Ooh, this song's on guitar hero too. And then I'll know (laughs) all the guitar lines because the the sound mixing emphasizes the guitars. And then also guitar hero two is kind of what got me dabbling into harder difficulties and challenging myself. Cause up to that point, I thought video games are just something you were supposed to have a nice, easy breezy time with. I didn't see any point for there to be any difficulties other than easy But as I kind of became acclimated to Guitar Hero and the three first buttons that you get on easy, and then I bumped it up to medium as I got better, and then hard as I got better, and then eventually expert. And it felt fantastic to be able to pull off all of these hammer-ons and pull-offs in very quick succession in a way that made the person who was watching you's mouth drop. And I like that a lot. (laughs) Wow. That's a good point, yeah. If Guitar Hero 2 is the game that sent Christian down on his crazy difficulty path, yep. that that was like a crossroads in his young life. Imagine him if he'd not done that. I know. There's a universe, if you believe in multi-universes. There's a universe <laughs> where Christian is not good at games. 
And the rest of us are. I know. I was going to say, and, and there's a universe where I am. So <laughs> That's funny that you say that, Christian. I remember, I still, for the life of me, I, I cannot get past Rock This Town on Experts. Really? Yeah. I see. I can't blame you, Mike. Some of those expert songs had me tripped up for days at a time. But I was just so bored and didn't have anything else to do. And I didn't have a memory card. So if I turned it off, I lost all my progress. So I just did it anyway. You know, gu- Guitar Hero and like Rock Band, those are the types of games that w- when you play them and you have people watching, like those are like really good games that people can, you know, spectate and watch, right? Because, yeah, totally. Like you, you can, you can, you do feel kind of like a rock star when you <laughs> pull off some of those really difficult uh difficult tricks i guess yeah and at the very least the person watching you can just listen to the music yeah exactly so good good that's a good pick christian that defined not not only your childhood but that defined who you are today as a person exactly <laughs> although that was probably like three weeks ago so <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes i was 12 years old three weeks ago <laughs> in roger years you were <laughs> What about you, Blue? What is one game that defines your childhood? Yeah, like Christian said, there are a bunch of choices that you could nominate. It could be Super Mario 3, or it could be Super Mario Kart, or it could be Donkey Kong Country. Uh, But what I'm going to put forward as my choice is actually Dr. Mario. Oh. Because my sisters and I had this fierce, fierce rivalry going on Dr. Mario, uh, on the two-player Dr. Mario, for really as long as I can remember. And so there'd be the three of us playing, and whoever lost had to step out, and then the other one would switch in. But it got to the point where all of us could crank the difficulty up as high as it would go and the speed up as high as it would go and just sit there and just compete with each other for hours. And we did this through our entire childhood from like little tiny to I have pictures of us all in college still playing this against each other. And I am not even of the three of us. I'm not even the best one. Wow. So... (laughs) Uh, do, are your sisters older or younger? Or are you a middle child? They're both younger than me. They're both younger than you. Okay. Yeah. So pride, at least before, used to dictate that I should be the best, but <laughs> yeah. that's not how it worked out. Do they do they still play games? Like, could you crack, could you pop this game in and say, "All right, let's do this"? And would you beat them now? Do you think? Oh, they could play Doctor Mario today still. Oh, okay. Okay. But if I put on any other game, they wouldn't be interested. Oh, okay. But Dr. Mario is special. Oh, that's awesome. That is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would get so mad if my younger siblings beat me at games. For sure. <laughs> I, would. I, I do have a really bad story, and I may have told this on the podcast, but where my brother, he's 10 years younger than, no, seven years younger than me, and he was 10 and I was 17, and him and his friend were beating me at Street Fighter 2, and I lightly pulled out their controller plugs but made it look like they were still plugged in and then i mm-hmm. beat up on them really bad yeah i was really there's a learning moment for veteran him. move right there <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i was teaching my lesson in life <laughs> uh that's a good pick uh what about you mike um so yeah like blue said uh there's so many that you could say that defined your childhood like for me even uh, you know, Mario World, Mar- the original Mario, Zelda, I have some amazing memories with that. But if I'm going all the way back to thinking and to what really got me into gaming, I want to have to go all the way back and I'm going to say Keystone Capers oh. on the Atari 2600, which um, I played. I, I didn't have it. My neighbor had it. And I played. So I don't know if anybody's ever played it before, but basically you're a, a police officer in a mall and you're chasing after a robber, and um, you have to reach the robber before time runs out or before he makes it to the top floor of the mall. And um, and it's just like a regular Atari game. That that's all it is, and it just gets progressively harder. Yeah. Um, it was an Activision game, so it was it was good quality. They did a lot of great. Activision had so many great Atari games. Um, Keystone Capers, obviously Pitfall, Stampede. 
what barnstorming river raid so many good ones <laughs> yeah um but i this one i just was always just the first memory i have at playing video games was being that being that cop chasing after uh chasing after that robber ducking under uh remote control planes jumping over shopping carts <laughs> going up the escalator so I, I i didn't know the name of the game until i was older i so i was just a little kid and i thought that the game was called uh Elevators and escalators, because those are the two ways you can get to the different floors. <laughs> that's like not a bad name. It's yeah. Not, yeah. So that's when I was just a little kid. I'm like, I want to play elevators and escalators. What? <laughs> you mean shoots and ladders, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they pull out shoots and ladders like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> get that out of here and I flip it over. Yeah, but it was. Exactly. But yeah, so that's, that's the one I loved as a kid. And I still love playing it. I actually bought... They had the Activision Anthology on the uh, Game Boy Advance, and I played that, and I played Keystone Capers for just days and days on end, just oh, trying to awesome. beat my own high score. <laughs> that's awesome. And when and when when the Xbox 360 launched the Xbox 360, um, I, it was some kind of arcade. You you where you can buy actual like arcade games or um, Atari and Intellivision games. That was the one of the first games I bought. Was that. Uh, um, was Keystone Capers. Oh, that's awesome. Wow, so, yeah. that's so cool. That's so cool. And you never became a, like a mall cop after that then or anything? Eh. No, man. I, I, I was so bad at the game that it just ruined all my hopes and dreams of eventually becoming a mall cop. Yeah. That's probably the exam they give you for the job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. What do you think of Keystone Capers? Yeah. <laughs> Here you go. got to play this. Yeah. <laughs> Can you oh. jump over a shopping cart? Yeah. Nope. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Better luck next time. Oh, uh, that's a good pick. Uh, for myself, I would have to say, like like all of you, I have a lot of games that I played as a kid, and, and I could have picked any of these, but one game in particular, I would have to say, kind of defined my childhood, um, was uh, Jungle Hunt. Have you, anyone played Jungle Hunt on the yeah. Atari 2600? Going vine to vine? Yep. Yep, so it was like the poor man's pitfall. Yeah. <laughs> it was pitfall without the running. Yes, exactly. And, uh, you know, so, so you know, it, like all games back then, like they didn't really tell you the reason why all, any of this happened, right? Like, it just... You it's not played important. This game. It's not yeah. important, yeah. No. You, headhunters apparently captured your girlfriend and put her in a pot, and you have to go save her. I mean, yeah. that's... That makes sense. Right. Yeah. In a pot, yeah. of course. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, I guess a cauldron or something. <laughs> oh, in that case. <laughs> I don't know. You know what I mean? Like a big, you know, like the cartoon, po- you know, like in Bugs Bunny, how Bugs Bunny was always in like the big pot that he's cutting up carrots. They're cutting up carrots and they're going to make him into a stew. Yeah. They're going to do that with your girlfriend. So, yeah, you had to go save her. So the reason that this game, I think, defines or de- defined my childhood is because it didn't have a story. But then we would go into the real world and make a story of like what happened and how this happened, and then we we would have like real challenges in real life. Created your own fan fiction for Jungle Hunt, <laughs> pretty much awesome. <laughs> and you know, so we would and and so then we would pick people in our real life and say, "Oh, like that person's that person in the game." <laughs> How many characters are in the game? Well, uh, so there's one part where these boulders are coming at you. <laughs> and and so there's this guy, our neighbor, he was much older than us. So I was like in third grade, probably. No, I was younger than that. No, I was probably like third grade. And our neighbor who like took our plastic bat, you know, like the plastic bats they had. As a kid, you know, those big plastic bats. So you had the wiffle ball and you hit them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, right. He would take rocks, he would take our bat, and he was in high school, and he hit it with rocks, and it, like, hit towards us, which didn't make any sense. So we always pretend that's with those boulders that were coming at us. And his, and his name was Lee, so we called him Lee the Bat Denter, because he dented her bat because of that. And then that applied to the video game, so that that's why the boulders were coming. So it had nothing to do with the girlfriend that was captured. It had to do with real people that were in our life. And it was so... Weird. I don't know. <laughs> it sure was. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like we, and I've said this before on another podcast, but we would, you know, games weren't so intricate or so detailed like they are now, right? So 
you would go out and play in the real world, but we would take the things that happen in video games and apply them to the real world. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. That's I guess that game defined my childhood. So, Listeners, what's one game that defined your childhood? You can let us know. You can send us a tweet at GamerHeadsPC. You can send us an email at info at GamerHeadsPodcast. You can also uh, go to our website at GamerHeadsPodcast.com or go to Facebook.com slash GamerHeadsPodcast and leave us a message there as well. All right, so let's move on to the news. And uh, Christian, we'll start with you. What do you have news-wise? Sure. So Tuesday was a very busy day in the video game world. This past Mm -hmm. Tuesday was. Uh, One of the reasons being that the PlayStation State of Play happened. And it was just a little uh, short little 30-minute video. Uh, We mentioned it on last podcast, I think, that they were potentially teasing Last of Us 2 stuff. And we did get some Last of Us 2 trailer footage. We got a release date coming this february we also got uh what was it humanity mitsugushi's next game the dude who made tetris effect and res and one of the creative geniuses behind luminous medieval demo that's coming at you watam is coming by the same guy who made katamari damasi and civilization 6 is coming to ps4 which i think was kind of a given considering that game's been out on switch for like a year now but The thing that stood out to me that I found interesting was that there was a Call of Duty Modern Warfare trailer for this as well. It was a story trailer for Call of Duty Modern Warfare. You know, that's fine. That's all well and good. This is a multi-platform game. But uh, the past couple of entries have had like map packs or extra content come to PS4 like a week or a month beforehand before it comes out to the rest of the stuff. That's fine. But the interesting part is that they announced that... A game mode is coming exclusively to PS4 first, and it is a co-op survival mode. Ooh. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting because usually Call of Duty games recently in the modern era have three main components. There's usually the single player campaign. There is the competitive multiplayer, which is what most people play. And then there is the cooperative component. And so the cooperative component is kind of switched up over the years. Uh, it was zombies for the Treyarch stuff until like every company basically adopted zombies. Uh, or else it was like wave based stuff. Modern Warfare 3 had a wave based thing. Uh, Ghosts had a wave based survival thing. So did Advanced Warfare. And so what this appears to be is. A Call of Duty Modern Warfare cooperative survival mode is coming exclusive to PS4 for the first year. It will only be on PS4, which is crazy. So I didn't know that during the presentation. I didn't realize that this exclusivity is happening for an entire year. And all they've said is that it's the cooperative survival component. So that could be a third of the game that they're potentially locking off for an entire year until the game is basically obsolete because they come out with a new Call of Duty game every year. Yeah. So... Yeah, that that's exactly what I was going to say. It's like, <laughs> that's pretty uh, bold of them to think people will still care in a year. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, so needless to say, people are upset and they're canceling pre-orders left and right. Oh, man. Oh, snap. So, yeah, my um, my husband, I I think we've pre-ordered every Call of Duty since, I don't know, probably since the second one. Like, I can't even remember a time when we haven't pre-ordered Call of Duty and we got to get the map packs and we got to get everything. Oh, geez. And uh, he always, always, always plays it so much that we get our money's worth out of it. So it's, you know, um, I don't ever argue. I was like, yep, I know you'll, you'll get your money's worth out of it. <laughs> out of this, you know, $100 purchase. So, but this time... I was like, so you are you going to pre-order that? And he's like, nah, I don't wow. think I will. Because he, he um, is busy with Destiny 2 and that relaunch is coming soon. And then he also got Borderlands 3. And he's like, no, I just, I'm not going to have time for it. So I'm not going to get it. Wow. And then the new trailer came out yesterday. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> he watched that and he's like, I'm so sold. I'm getting it right now. <laughs> Fascinating. So, 
How does they he... lost some subscribers, but I know they got a new one. <laughs> yeah. What was it that you think sold them on it? Uh, the gameplay. The gameplay? Okay. Uh... Yeah. I mean, it's just... He, he, he plays shooters and that's basically all he plays and so uh for years i could never get him to play anything else besides call of duty until destiny came along because he never liked the way the gun mechanics worked i see um so yeah so when he said he wasn't going to get it i was like what are you serious but yeah the trailer won him over so I, i'm just curious how does he like borderlands 3 he likes it a lot. I think it's, um, you know, it's a little different than, than what he's used to, but I think that's good for him. Cool. Well, there you go, Christian. Mm -hmm. You won over somebody that hasn't played the game before, mm -hmm. and you actually mm -hmm. provided a good <laughs> recommendation. <laughs> the yeah, when you said... Life. The first time ever. <laughs> when you said the shooting was more like Call of Duty, he's like, I'm going to play that. <laughs> <laughs> Nice, nice. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, I didn't catch actually the state of play, so I didn't get to see any of that. So it was short. It was thirty minutes. It was mm -hmm. you know Nintendo Direct ripoff, yeah. like most things are these days. But because of that, it wasn't as good because you know Nintendo they got their thing down. They got the tone down. That happy, cheery. Move on to the next thing. Move on to the next thing. A good pacing. This one <laughs> the was just. Tone. Yes, the tone. The tone is so important, and if you don't believe me, watch Xbox Live. Oh, yikes. Oh, really? Mm. Oh, you went there. I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> I. It has to be said. Somebody should tell them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so uncomfortable. What, so I didn't see that either. Like what? So since we're kind of on that news, like what, what was so terrible about that? So they kind of go I, more like a silly route. And they've got all this scripted banter that's just kind of forced. It doesn't flow, but everything's like, you know, 110% energy. Oh, my God. Can you believe this? And then oh. it's um, even at the end, like they're making fun of themselves. Like, you know, check back at the next Xbox Live for more of this scripted banter you love so much. And I was just, it's, it's so cringy. Oh. It's just uh. take it down about, you know. 30% at least, and then then maybe I, we can talk. <laughs> I always feel like when people do that, they're overcompensating, right? I mean... I don't know. I just I think they're going for a tone, a, a specific high energy, happy, mm -hmm. excited, let's get pumped tone. But to me, it comes across as really disingenuous and forced. Yeah, it's real fake. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's my point. If you really, truly were like energetic or like excited about something you don't have to fake it mm -hmm. and then that it shows me like maybe you don't believe in your own product and i don't know if i should believe in your product then that's just maybe my or maybe it's just like you know let's just be regular people or that, about that it that and too. we can yeah. still sell a product that way yeah i mean i can i you know i think you can get passionate and not get fakey excited right so mm -hmm. So, yeah. so, so like, like a lot of those uh, really, 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 really awkward E3 uh, presentations mm -hmm. by the, yeah. the people who are up on the stage and just yes. you could tell they don't know anything about games or don't care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you could tell the script said, read line excitedly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it was, been, you know, yeah, when you had like, not, not the... Not that they're not gamers or anything, but like when you had bands come out there, like I know Weezer came out one time and like presented some games and you're like, what is Weezer doing here? They're not in the game. Their music's not in the game. They were available. They're, they were available. <laughs> like, hey, we're in here. We're here for a concert. Hey, do you want to do a additional show for, for like $2,000? Uh, Somebody sure. somewhere called in a favor, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I can get Weezer to show up. <laughs> they owe me something. Yeah. <laughs> oh that's funny uh anything else christian no no that was it okay uh what about you blue what do you have so yes yeah, speaking of xbox live that happened yesterday uh the biggest announcement that they probably had was their project x cloud which mm. is a game streaming service that's set to launch in october in limited fashion so it will open to members of the public in the U.S., South Korea, and the U.K., and you can sign up 
to be selected for the trial that begins in October. It is, uh, let's see, the project's corporate vice president, Kareem Chowdhury, explained in a news update that he had been using xCloud to play multiplayer pirate jaunty of thieves from home with his kids joining in on console and PC, while office staff had been playing Halo 5 Guardians and Gears 5 on smartphone and tablet devices and the technical preview is to take the form of a phase test with participant numbers limited at first but gradually expanding and it's only for android devices what Mm -hmm. so okay people really want to play these games on their android devices this is weird to me I think it's a, I don't know if, I'm sure they were planning something like this before, but it seems to me to be a Google Stadia response. But on Android devices? It's just for the, the, uh, the, the technical test, oh, the phase okay. test. So, so is this like I'm a, sure. is this, yeah. are they moving everything to like this X cloud? uh from a gaming perspective then or is this something you have to sign i mean do you have to pay for this service details will come later okay, okay. <laughs> i'm all sure right, all, right. all right well i'm yep. just wondering like or is this in prep for their new system i, I guess those are the things i'm wondering like yeah how's that gonna affect me as a gamer does it mean like all the games that i play on game pass now will go through the x cloud i don't no. know i don't know in, no, I in the presentation like one thing they emphasized is is that it's 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 your own account and you can just access it from a new place. You know, it's your own uh, saves, it's your own friend list, your own games. So I yeah. But it's not streaming from your console either. I don't think it's streaming from the Xbox Cloud, but they're going mm-hmm. to have another like technology service thing where you're going to be able to supposedly stream games from your local console to your device but that's not what x cloud is you're streaming it from a server farm xbox to your device mm-hmm. oh. okay that sounds not interesting to me <laughs> no, <I'm> just, <laughs> i just you know what i mean like i'm not gonna yeah. play games on a on, a, on a, a device outside of my console i don't i don't know i just don't get this appeal i don't know this whole concept is... yeah <laughs> I, let's yeah, just hope I don't it know. doesn't do well. It... <laughs> I, no, I'm not joking. I hope because if the, let's say this thing is ridiculously successful, so the, so now Xbox is, they're going to say, oh, okay, well our next console because of the positive uh, reception is going to be all digital. Yeah, mm-hmm. they tried that with the Xbox One, didn't they? Oh, they did with the <laughs> Xbox All Digital system. Oh yeah, the Xbox Sad. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Does anybody have sales numbers on that? Uh, I forgot it even existed. I don't know if anybody even bought Actually, that. I kind of did, too. I haven't heard a thing about it <laughs> yeah. since they announced it. There was an all-digital well, PSP it... back in the day, the PSP Go. That's true. Another thing we forgot existed. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I guess we'll find out more about this, but it just seems, it just seems so weird. Yeah, I, I don't seems... know. I just... like I guess... <laughs> I mean, I guess if you had a you had a, a tablet and you felt like dragging a controller around with you, maybe like maybe if I traveled for work and so I was constantly on the go and I didn't always want to play my Switch, maybe. Yeah, but maybe. I I definitely don't see the appeal of playing you know Gears Five on my phone. That seems yeah. not yeah. fun. Yeah, the game yeah. selection, at least with this test, being Sea of Thieves, Gears 5, and Halo 5, seems kind of paltry, and it doesn't really appeal to the general public, I wouldn't think. Because, you know, your dad isn't going to be like, ooh, I can finally play Halo 5 on my iPad. Or your little sister isn't going to go, oh, I can finally play Gears 5 on my phone. <laughs> yeah. But then again, your general public is not going to be the ones watching Xbox Live and likely signing up for the test. Yeah, but it would benefit the people who don't have an Xbox the most. But I feel like the people who already have an Xbox are the ones who are going to want to use it. Well, that's yeah. that's the that's the weird part. Yeah, because it feels like it's a it's another avenue for they're they're saying, oh, this is an avenue or revenue that we don't that we don't have a foothold in yet, right? So let's reach out to this 
public that may have tablets or phones or whatever or or surfaces that hey now they can play you know gears 5 or you know sea of thieves or any of these games but you're right i mean those people are not going to be out there trying to find and if they do there's a very small percentage of those people i would think majority of them if they're going to be playing pc games are be playing pc games on their pc (laughs) machine that they built that's Mm -hmm. designed to play pc games not stream games it seems weird Mm mm-hmm yeah, I suppose it's it's kind of like Stadia in the fact that we don't really know who the audience is yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. Stadia launches soon, right? Yeah, pre-order now. So I guess uh, <laughs> we'll know more mm-hmm. later. I guess so, yeah. And is anybody, uh, anybody going to get Stadia or did you purchase Stadia? <laughs> did you purchase no. Stadia? No, but then again, I mean... Not yet, but if you can, what I forget what they said it was. Was it like five bucks a month or something? It was not much, and you can stream it from an existing console using your existing controllers. Yeah. The only thing you have to do is have access to like a Google Chrome. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. I might try it, considering it's only a five dollar experiment. Yeah. We'll see. It depends we'll on see. how what kind of games. I mean, I we know there's quite a few, but mm-hmm. it's uh, weird seeing the Borderlands three commercials and seeing the Stadia logo on the platforms at the end of them because yeah. it's not even out yet. It's weird. I feel like that's probably what we're going to see for the next year is Stadia logos on platform names at the end of video game ads. But it's weird. Hmm. What was that? What was that one that started? Ouya, right? Ouya. <laughs> wasn't oh yeah. Well, oh yeah wasn't that uh wasn't that a streaming system too no no okay. it was just an all digital platform that okay all tanked. digital platform okay yeah okay so <laughs> did we say ouya on the, the tags of game trailers as well <laughs> mm. at one point i'm just wondering I'm just i don't wondering, think so like, no it was okay. like largely an android thing so the performance wasn't there to push like big triple a stuff yeah. Okay. I yeah. Well, we'll find out in a couple of weeks, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yep. Anything else, Blue? No. Uh, what about you, Mike? Do you have anything? You, yeah. Well, you know, keeping on the topic of amazing uh, decisions by corporate. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, PlayStation has just launched its own online store in the U.S., which um, allows consumers to go straight to the source. For all their gaming needs. So um, they're going to have physical copies of games as well as hardware, bundles, accessories, as well as subscriptions. Uh, According to the PlayStation blog post, they said, This site not only provides our fans in the U.S. with the option to purchase these items directly from PlayStation, but is also intended to help gift givers easily find the right product for their friends or family. Fans will find that prices on the new store align with those found at other retailers. Uh, yeah, so... Challenge accepted on that. Yeah, challenge yeah, accepted. Yeah. To, find, to find, yeah, in line. I, I, I don't know. I, uh, my, uh, my Best Buy um, Gamer Rewards yeah. is still in, in play. Gamers I think Club it Unlocked. Goes, Gamers Club Unlocked, thank you. Uh, that, I still have that. And that, could, that, for me, I've got that going until, I think, January. Ooh. So, if you, if PlayStation, the if their online store offers games at 20% off retail price i'm on board but when they say price competitively they just mean full Mm -hmm. msrp yeah that's exactly what they mean yeah but i could totally see why they would want to do this because um why should you know gamestop and amazon and best buy and all of these outlets get the money for sales and pre-orders and blah 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 and why shouldn't playstation just keep it in-house yeah but they have an online. I, but they have the PlayStation online. I mean, you know, I can well, buy. Well, yeah, digitally. but as as we all know and have talked about many times, there's still the market for the physical copies, and that's where PlayStation loses out. Yeah, I just think when you take into consideration all the other options, the going to PlayStation.com to order your PS4 bundle or whatever is going to be one of the lower 
on the totem pole mm-hmm. because you've got you've got you've got your brick and mortar stores and then you've got Amazon yeah. which is like one day delivery. Yep. So they're going to have <laughs> right, to do <exactly>. something <laughs> free yeah. one day two day delivery. Right, exactly. And so the only way I can see them competing is if they have um online store exclusives. Yeah. Uh-oh. Like certain skins like console skins or controllers or you know, something like that. Yeah. That's the, the new uh, Death Stranding PS4 Pro. Yeah. The yellow Special edition. The clear yellow controller. <laughs> the P yellow controller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised, Mike. You might be onto something there where there's going to be PlayStation store physical copy thing exclusives. Mm-hmm. Pre-order bonuses or something. Yeah. That's how they, that's how they can stay competitive. If they're just trying to go toe to toe with with the brick and mortar and Amazon, good luck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or they can stay competitive by, like, if they do something like they do on, like, their online store where, hey, we're going to have a flash sale. And, you know, all these games by this publisher are going to be 25% off, blah, 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 right? So that's a possibility, too. Or even pre-order with us and you'll get this exclusive physical bonus. I'm sick of... Yeah. A skin. <laughs> well, hey, hey, I, when I pre-ordered uh, Kingdom Hearts 3, the sword the, or the keyblade that was the pre-order bonus, I used that through the whole game. That oh, was wow. my favorite one. All right. Well, that's, that's a valid point. You know, I picked up Lollipop Chainsaw and I was upset that I never pre-ordered it because if you pre-ordered it, you'd get the Ash Williams costume. Um Oh, and really? That's never been made available anywhere else, only for pre-orders. Yikes. Oh, uh, that's funny. So I see where you're coming from. Yeah, it, they have to be worth it, though. Yeah. A uh, costume, uh, probably not so much, but something you can actually use and that makes a difference in your gameplay. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, I guess we'll see about that, too. Uh, anything else, Mike? That is all. Uh, the only thing that I was going to bring up, and, and I can talk more about this when we get to the games we're currently playing, but I did uh, download the Google Play Pass, mm-hmm. or I guess not oh, download, yes. subscribe to the Google Play Pass, and so right now we get a 10-day trial and, when you first sign up. And it's weird because when I signed up, I asked Christian, did you sign up? And it was what, yesterday, I think, Christian, right? Wasn't it? Uh, yes. Either yesterday or Tuesday. What other very day was like the first day? Yeah. And, and you, you said that there was a delay or not delay, but there was a, uh, release, a sc- release schedule on this or something. Yeah. I had problems getting the Google play pass cause I wanted in, I wanted all these dirty, nasty ad free apps on my phone. <laughs> so I was like, when is this happening? And I realized it happened like the day that they announced it. And so I go on my Google Play Store app and I don't see anything about Google Play Pass. So I look it up, I Google it, and it says it should be in your little hamburger menu. So I go to my hamburger menu, it's not there. So I Google, why is my Google Play Pass not in the menu? (laughs) And I get someone who asked that. There's like one person who asked this out on the internet. And then some Google Play support lady was like, we are staggering the release. It should be available to everyone in the US by the next day. So I waited 24 hours. It still wasn't available. And then I started getting desperate. So that's when I started like scrolling down the list because this support question was like a forum post of like a bunch of people being like, what the heck, Google? I hate Google. Why is Google doing this? Why don't they support their devices? What's happening? And so eventually one person said they were able to get around. Well, there were a bunch of workarounds. One person said, click on an app that's on the Google Play Pass, and that will show you a Google Play Pass option. You can get to it there. That didn't work for me. One person said, switch accounts, create a new Google account, and then you can get the Google Play Pass. So I created a new account, and boom, there it was. But I didn't want to juggle two Google Play Pass accounts. So I went back to my other account, and I found one person who said, go to an app that you have already purchased, go back out to the main menu, and then you should see it. And that's what happened with them. So I went to an app I purchased, I went back out to the main Google Play menu, boom, I had the Google Play Pass option, and that's what allowed me to subscribe. How oh. annoying. It was bad. Well, that and, that was like an epic journey. Yes, <laughs> it was. Because we know what my journey was. I went to Google Play. I hit the hamburger plus menu. And there it was. And I signed up. <laughs> yeah. I can't play Wizards Unite, but I can certainly 
<laughs> sign up for the Google pa- Play Pass. Uh, so we can talk more about that with the games that we're currently playing. But I did sign up for that. I in, oh, so it's 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 a ten day trial, and then after that, it's a dollar ninety nine a month for twelve months, and then after that, then it's four ninety nine a month every month after that. So, uh, we'll see. I don't know. I I downloaded one game so far. Yay. <laughs> so, I downloaded. You got 10. your money's worth. You downloaded Patrick? ten games. Yes. Does I have a question? Yeah. Does it have Cake Mania? <gasps> I did not see Cake. Did you see Cake Mania, Christian? No, I don't think that's on there. Yeah. Oh. No buy. Yeah, that's a I, deal breaker. <laughs> that is a deal breaker. I need my Cake Mania. Yeah, I I or downloaded. What about Diner it. Dash? I didn't. See that's a, Dash. that's I true. I didn't see Diner Dash. Oh well, then forget it. Yeah, I saw Limbo. <laughs> I saw Stardew Valley. Yes. I saw Rain. Was it wasn't it called Rain? Some Rain. There was two Rain games on there, right? Oh yes, Rains. I believe it's called. Rains. Rains. Uh, I downloaded Card Thief, which is like a solitaire game. <laughs> That seems Woo. no. <laughs> okay, okay. So here's here's the we talked about this when Jordan was on the show, and he talked about Apple Arcade Pass or whatever it's called, right? Apple Arcade. And Christian and 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 Jordan were on board with this whole thing. This is great. This is awesome. And then I and and myself and I think Blue and uh, Blue, you're kind of the same boat. And I guess Mike, you weren't there. I guess I was wondering what your thoughts are, but. I don't know. Mobile gaming is just not something that I do. <laughs> what about you, Mike? Do you are you is that something that interests you? Cake mania. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I like, cake, cake, I like mania. cake mania. I'm with I'm with my <laughs> cake mania. I no, searched that's... cake mania and the yeah. Google Play Pass game I got was Pastry Paradise, which oh. is a match oh. three game. Oh, that's the go oh. box. <laughs> that's the Doctor Three. Thunder of <laughs> the Doctor Thunder. <laughs> that's the Doctor Thunder of Cake Mania. Of... <laughs> Match three is not even close. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like Cake Mania meets uh, Candy Crush or something like that, right? Um, uh, but, but I mean, playing Stardew Valley on my phone or playing Limbo on my phone or playing any like game that requires like more than just a simple sliding thing. Oh, that just would just annoy the hell out of me. I can't do it. I can't do it. Can't do it. So anyway, uh, well, well, uh, well go yeah, on. let me know when Cake Mania comes yeah, up on there. Yeah. Thanks. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's all I had for news then. So, uh, let's move on to our listener feedback. And listeners, you can give us feedback. Christian, how can they send us a tweet? At Gamerheads PC on Twitter. And how can they send us an email? Info at GamerheadsPodcast.com. And how can they send us uh, on our website? I'm sorry. <laughs> GamerheadsPodcast.com. And what about our Facebook page? Facebook.com slash GamerheadsPodcast. Okay. So last week we asked the question, what's your favorite use of a licensed song in a video game? And Mike, do you want to take the first one there? Sure, this comes from at the Retrobyte. They said, okay, this may not be what you're expecting, but I love the use of Chicago. If you leave me now, in GTA V, Trevor and Patricia scene, totes emotion. I love what Grand Theft Auto V did with uh, the music stuff. I really like that a lot. I think that's the first Grand Theft Auto to do it. I'm probably wrong. Other Grand Theft Autos have probably done it, but basically where there's a moment in the game in like a story mission or something, and as soon as you get into a vehicle, a certain song will begin playing regardless of what's what's you know on the radio oh, at yeah. the time. Yeah. Very clever, very great, sets up some very poignant moments like the one the Terabyte sent us. Did you guys, uh, I mean, so, so that was like one of the things I really liked about- The Retrobyte, I'm sorry, Roger. Oh, the retro bite. Oh, that's okay. Uh, you know what? You know what I liked uh, when when you jump to different cars in the early. Maybe it's even the newer ones too. I haven't played too much of the uh, Grand Theft Autos, like the newer ones. But when you jumped in a certain car, car based on that car, you would the radio station that it was set to was 
was, you know, so like it might be a classic station if it was like a, a, a cool oldies car, mm-hmm. right? Or or it might be like talk radio if it was more like a yes. hipster car, right? Wasn't that cool? That was cool. Yes. I freaking love Grand Theft Auto talk radio. That like, yeah. when I was yeah. little, I would just put on Chatterbox, sit in the car, listen to that for hours on end. That's all I needed. Yeah. Uh, Christian, want to take the next one? Yeah, this one's from SC Scans, Scanlizen. Scanslin? Close. I'm sorry for butchering your name. S.C. Scanlan. I think there, I, there's supposed to be an A. Scanlan. No? Perfect. Yeah. He said, the Joker singing Only You and You Alone by the Platters at the end of Arkham City. Yeah. Amazing. I remember that. Yeah. That was that was cool. Nice. That Yeah, in, in character, too. That was so cool. Way better than the ending to Arkham Asylum, I can tell you that much. Mm. They botched that ending. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> blue do you want to take the next one sure this is from l frank gaming and they tweeted the zany skrillex slash damian marley collab that plays during the weed burning scene in far cry 3 always struck me as just about a perfect choice <laughs> mm. yeah i don't know that scene but it, in my head i am i'm getting a, a feel for it oh it's so bizarre that was like the first time I ever experienced something like that in a game. I was like 15 or something, and I'm just playing Far Cry 3, and then I'm burning weed, and then this dubstep comes out of nowhere. <laughs> it's so weird. Oh, it's so weird. Hmm. Uh, I have not played Far Cry 3. It's my favorite Far Cry. It's a great game. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I never really got into the Far Cry games until Primal, actually. So, uh, mm, that's a pretty easy platinum, Roger. <laughs> is it? <laughs> I guess maybe I have to finish it. It's okay. It's a good game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, do you want to take the next one? Sure. This comes from at Anthrax four four two. I think I've got to go with Paranoid in Rock and Roll Racing. Mm. Oh, wow. Throwback. That's, yeah, that yeah. is a throwback. That is a throwback, <laughs> for sure. Uh, and then, Christian, you want to take the last one there? Sure. WSKOSC said, Omega Boost by Polyphony Digital on PS1 had Fly by Loudmouth in the intro, and it's glorious. Hmm. Some of these games I've never played. I need to play more games, apparently. <laughs> I feel like we tell you that every week. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and then then he'll get the game. Yeah, then I'll get it and I won't play it. Um no, I I never played Omega Boost. Uh interesting. Uh thanks everybody for giving the feedback for that. And then we have uh f- on iTunes, we have feedback on iTunes. Blue, do you want to read that? Sure. Uh it's titled Top Quality Video Game Podcast 5 Stars. This is by far my favorite video game podcast where one of the hosts is named after a primary color of light. (laughs) The crew are very entertaining and complement each other well with their thoughtful discussions, frivolous banter, and in-depth reviews. I would recommend this podcast to anyone else who spends their mornings on a bicycle avoiding death as they make their way begrudgingly to a job they hate. (laughs) Yeah, so so when you're on your bike and you're listening to our podcast... Please do pay attention to what you're doing, because <laughs> I, I, the avoiding death part really made me a little nervous there. <laughs> Though Neighborhood's podcast is not responsible for any accidents yeah, that may yeah. occur while riding one's bike. Absolutely. Though, if one does have to listen to something on their last moments on Earth, we are oh, honored. Yeah. That yeah. is a good point. <laughs> Such a glasses half full kind of guy. I try. <laughs> Instead of like, instead of Rosebud, last dying words are gamer hats. <laughs> <laughs> what does that even mean? Yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much for the kind words, Archery Dan. That was very, very kind of you. Yes, so thank, thank you. Indeed. Uh, and, and listeners, if you want to give us feedback, uh, you can certainly do so. We will read your feedback on air. You can go to iTunes and there's a link in our show notes. You can go to iTunes uh, site or account, I guess, and then you can leave us a review there. Uh, and that helps us grow the show, not only because we get your feedback and then we know what you're listening or looking for when you're listening to our show, but then that also helps us because that helps us move up in the chart- charts on iTunes 
and then lets other people know that, hey, we exist. <laughs> we exist as a video game podcast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so leaving us a review uh, helps us uh, so we can read that review on air, and then we, we reflect on that. We talk about it. Um, but if you just leave a star review, too, or a five-star review, or any star review, I guess. So I'm not going to tell you what kind of star review you leave, but five-star review, five star reviews are obviously the most appreciated. But just even leaving us a review like that actually helps us grow, too. So thank you so much. It helps us get past the iTunes gatekeepers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, uh, they have a pretty uh, pretty tight guard there, and mm-hmm. they're, uh, they're gatekeepers, mm-hmm. so. Uh, all right. So, well, thanks, everybody. Let's move on to the games that we're currently playing. And Blue, we'll start with you. What games are you currently playing? So I, what did I play this week? Oh, oh yes. Okay. So last week we talked about the Mario Kart North American Open. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was a disaster. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> I did worse than you, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing was, I mean, it started out about how you would expect it. Like, I mean, everybody on there was very, very competitive. And when you first pulled in or opened up the tournament, they showed the leaderboard. And like the person in first place had 322 points. So if you did the math, over 24 races, you had to average, I think it was 14.3 points. In order to get that score, and a win gives you 15. Yeesh. So, super competitive, right? Yeah. So, for a while, like the first half, I was I was about where I expected to be. Like, I'm placing 5th, 6th, 7th. You know, I'm just in the middle. I'm very average. And then, s- gradually, I noticed my lobbies are getting smaller. They're no longer the full lobbies of 12 people. They're like eight people or six people, or one time there was only two of us. And so I don't think much of it. Um, my, my placement is going up to reflect the, you know, fewer racers. So I'm doing better. I'm getting second or third or, you know, a couple of times I'm winning. And then I happen to notice, uh, Eventually, it kind of dawns on me that my points aren't really going anywhere. Mm. And then eventually, I notice on one of the times when I win, I only get 10 points. And so then I finally realize what other people probably realized way before me is that if the lobby's not full, Nintendo seemed to be giving you points from the bottom up as opposed to from the top down, if that makes sense. Yeah. So when they thought that I only got 10 points for winning, they're assuming that I beat 10 people instead of I won the race. Yeah. So, but by then it was too late to do anything about it. And I finished up my 24 race session and I went to start another one and they said, oh, you're welcome to keep playing. Your score won't count. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I was like, gosh, darn it. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so what, what, I mean, we would just, I mean, did they expect you just to quit out of the lobby and try to get back into a new one with more people in it? Because that happened to me too, where like a lot of my lobbies had like the full 12 people, but then a lot of them had like seven or people. And I'm like, well, this is weird. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. It doesn't seem fair for Nintendo to penalize us because they're not filling lobbies. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm sure it was something that they tried to do to make sure people weren't waiting a long time for races. Sure. But I would rather wait than be penalized. Yeah, exactly. I guess the takeaway is that if they hold one of these events again, I will go into it much better prepared. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, do I dare ask what your final score was? It was a hundred. Well, that's good. Blue, that's no, it's good. not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's not as good as it should have been. Well, do you know what my final score was? <laughs> you don't have to say if you don't want no, to. No, I don't care. I don't care. It was 61. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I got the highest I got was fourth place. And I was very proud of myself, but there was only like six or seven people that were playing in that race. So didn't seem mm-hmm. to really count, you know, so mm-hmm. yeah, that was, it was not 
uh, towards the end too i don't know how you were but i was just exhausted and I'm like just get this stuff over with this is 24 races i just want to get done oh no oh <laughs> <laughs> i play some <laughs> mario kart <laughs> i finished up and i was like okay come on let's do it again <laughs> I was, well, see, I, I had my kids on my lap while I was playing too, because they wanted to watch. And then, and then I was just like, towards, they're like, are we almost done, dad? Is this almost done? Is this almost done, dad? I'm like, well, I, I, I'm at race 20. I have four more. Well, we're getting hungry. Can we go eat supper now? <laughs> <laughs> dad, I broke my leg. Not yeah. now. Not now. <laughs> not now. Remote Daddy races, is kid. racing. <laughs> Yeah. Do you not understand? I am racing in the Mario Kart tournament. Uh, yeah, that's funny. Can you just pause it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I cannot. <laughs> uh, what? Anything else you've been playing? So I went from that um, to Mario Kart Tour released this week. Oh. And I was not even a little bit interested in playing it. <laughs> After how the beta kind of finished up for me, which was basically that Mario Kart is always fun. And then they ruined it with these just like exhausted free to play mechanics. Yeah. You know, gatekeeping things behind timers. And oh, if you want better characters and carts, you better purchase the emeralds in the shop. You know, just that kind of nonsense. Yeah. So I was not going to play this at all. And then I thought, well, you know, I wonder if they took any of any of the feedback that I gave, you know, to heart. So I downloaded Mario Kart Tour and played it some. And, uh, you know, on the whole, it it seems the same. They uh, one thing that I do appreciate is that they uh, in the beta, you had a certain number of hearts and it cost a heart to enter a race. So when you mm -hmm. ran out of hearts, you had to wait till they came back or you could pay. So it looks like they did away with that altogether. There's no hearts anymore. And also for whatever reason, it's not emeralds anymore. It's rubies. I don't know what kind of what? feedback made them change the gemstone <laughs> of choice, but <laughs> it's different. It's um, weird. Yeah. Other than that, it seems really, really the same. I noticed going around news outlets was the fact that there's a subscription to this Mario Kart mm -hmm. tour that's $5 a month that gets you access to like 200cc and like mm -hmm. enhanced currency drops or something like that. And people love to point out how this, you know, subscription that's $5 a month on Mario Kart tour is the same price as Apple Arcade and the same standard price as the Google Play Pass and $2 more a month than the asking price of Nintendo Switch Online where you could just play freaking Super Mario Kart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and That's not even weird. not even good Super Mario Kart. Like, if you want to play Mario Kart on the go, take your 3DS or take your Switch because this is, like... Mario Kart with, I don't know, like with training wheels or something yes. because of the limitations of playing with a touch screen, because that's how you do it. You, you drag your finger to the left to turn left. You drag your finger to, to the right to turn right. And that's about what you got. So, um, if, if, if you want to get really precise with your driving, it's not going to happen here. Yeah. Do you think that they're trying to, again, trying to tap into this market like, oh, there might be people that have mobile devices that don't have Nintendo Switch but or Nintendo system at all, and they want to play Mario Kart. This I is don't why... know. It's very strange. It's very yeah. strange why they're doing this. Yeah. And uh, although, yeah, when Christian brings up that four ninety nine like Gold Pass subscription, in the beta, you started at the 50 CCs and you had to unlock the others. Mm. And then this one, when I very first started it, they say, hey, why don't you go straight to 150 CCs if you're, you know, a Mario Kart veteran? I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will, thanks. So they made some changes, but it's they not They did make enough. some changes. They were not the things, aside from the hearts, they were not the changes that I suggested. Mm. Wow. So. That apparently they don't know who you are. Apparently they don't. I'm a big deal. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> Primary color of light over here. I was just going to say. <laughs> <I know. laughs> that was so funny. 
<laughs> nice. Uh, anything else? Okay, so the other thing that I'm playing this week is, and Roger, you were right to say, uh, no, I don't have time for it <laughs> when I tried to give it to you, but I am playing Greedfall. Mm-hmm. And I am having different time with it than than Christian did, I think. <laughs> 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 kind of struggling over here kind of struggling so um yeah i will start with the positives this is of course an action rpg set in the 17th century i believe you know so you've got ships and you've got swords and you've got you know that kind of stuff um the the world building is fascinating this I love. This actually, I would like to read a series of fantasy novels set mm. in this world. Yeah. Um, especially, uh, like at the the beginning, you're kind of doing the tutorial in the the dock area, and there's a side quest where you have to hunt down a cabin boy, and it leads you to all this lore about the knots, which are a sailing guild that uses magic, and so children that are born, oh, what did they call him? like sea smart or I don't know, sea gifted, whatever. Those children have to be taken away from their families and given up to the, the knots. And so most of them don't know where they came from. Most of them don't know their parents. Hmm. And so the side quest that you have to do is there's a cabin boy who was given up to the knots as a, as a little tiny child and his parents have stolen him back. Oh, so you have to come to a resolution there. But yeah, I just thought, I love this, this, this kind of storytelling stuff is great. I want to know more. Yeah. And then also the dialogue is really great, which is a good thing. Cause the game is I'm five hours into it. And so far it's 80% talking. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I mean, if this is an action RPG, I'm waiting for the action, <laughs> but <laughs> You know, if the dialogue was boring or poorly written, like this would be a disaster. Yeah. You know, but it's not bad because it's explaining the lore and, you know, the ins and outs of this world that I find fascinating. So that is very good. Um, The things that are bad. (laughs) So due due to the fact that the game is 80% talking, you spend an awful lot of time looking at people's faces. And uh, the graphics, let's say, this looks to me like an early PS3 game, oh. which is really unfortunate because we're pretty much at the end of the life, life cycle of a PS4 yeah. console. And so it's just by the virtue of it being just so different from what's kind of expected now, it's just, it seems, it seems worse than than it should it it yeah. it brings more attention to itself than it it probably should if that yeah. makes sense no yeah absolutely um but especially especially the way that they've done the character's teeth <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> everybody's teeth are too white <laughs> and they have oh. they have taken the time to 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 draw every single tooth <laughs> And there's dark outlines around every single tooth. So whenever people are opening their mouths to talk, it's like you get almost the impression that the teeth are actually what's talking. And then it's just wearing this fleshy human suit around the teeth because the teeth is what what you can't stop looking at. Yeah. <laughs> can can we have this as a category in our end of year awards? <laughs> Best teeth in a game. Best teeth. I don't know. <laughs> it, well, it 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 yeah. Especially since back then, right? Because like, come on, during the Victorian age, I don't know how good their teeth would have been. <laughs> well, well, I don't know. They don't have magic and monsters either back That's then. So we good point. We could always just assume their teeth have been magically whitened and straightened. But <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's a it's far too much attention drawn to the teeth of all these people. I I know so, what you're saying. Is it, weird? is it weird that it makes me want to play the game more now? Yeah, right. That's <laughs> Wait, like- how about <laughs> how I'll post some screenshots and you can see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, totally with you, Blue, when it comes to 
the visuals for the faces, especially the character models, don't look mm-hmm. the best. And the lip syncing is just so lazily done. It feels like it was done with like the algorithm that they do on side quests and RPGs where they just hit the sync lips button and then the mouth just kind of undulates to the general word sounds. Yeah. And it's it doesn't look great, especially in a game where there's so much talking. But this is not a full $60 release from a budget, you know, developer. And I was admittedly impressed by the visuals when it came to the landscapes. So Mm -hmm. they are not all failures in the visual department. No, not all failures. And and, uh, um, the, the, yeah, the visuals, as far as the landscapes, they're, they're nice, but you don't spend that much time with them. Mm. At least, you know, in the first five, five Mm. hours. So especially because you do this weird leapfrogging thing across the map. So if you need to travel somewhere, um, you'll run towards the point on your map. And then in the middle of the road, there'll be this like a point marker and it will say, you know, press X to travel. And so then it will take you to the map and you'll go and select the map point that you want to travel to. And it will say, do you want to travel here? Travel time is 12 hours and 24 minutes. And so then you say yes, and then it skips you there. So it's, you don't spend much time wandering the map or looking at the landscape because you're leapfrogging around it. I got you. There's some side quests that'll get you out there in the wilderness a little bit. And what I find, what I found like genius was that when you get to one of these gates, right, and then you say, okay, I want to go here. It'll dump you out to like this little location where you've got your party members and you've got a shop. And Mm -hmm. I wish more RPGs had this feature because you can only carry so much stuff. You can be encumbered. So you can only carry so much weight of items and equipment and materials and everything has a weight to it. Just like a Bethesda game, which would get like stressful for me because I would be like, all right, what's the cost benefit analysis for all of this weight stuff that I'm carrying? When do I have to make a quick trip to town in order to sell the things that I actually need to sell? And where can I stash the stuff that I need to stash? In order to keep and in here every time you travel you're bumped out to a zone where you can sell everything that you need to and then it also gives you an excuse to talk to your party members who might have a quest for you while you're waiting for the next area to load mm-hmm. no yeah that's that's true it's uh it's not a game where you have to struggle to find a save point or struggle to find a shop or any anything like that. Like Christian said, all you have to do is travel and it will take you through one of those before you get to your destination. Hmm. Um, so as far as the gameplay, as far as the controls go, I, I'm struggling here with <laughs> the dodge in particular. I see. Because the character reacts so much more slowly than what I'm used to. And what I'm used to is 130 hours of Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And so I've spent 130 hours training myself to dodge at the absolutely (laughs) last moment possible because then you kind of get that slow time event. Mm -hmm. I forget what they call it. Um, And that gives you a couple of, you know, uh, a window to get a bunch of free hits. And so trying to untrain myself to do it in this game is it's killing me because it's so slow Mm -hmm. and it doesn't, the dodge doesn't take you very far away. So you have to like dodge, dodge, dodge to like actually truly get out of harm's way. (laughs) Um, like the, the very, the boss in the first area, Mm -hmm. the port area, like it would pull that spike out of its back and throw it at you, but you had to dodge before it threw the spike or it wouldn't do any good. So, yeah, that whole timing thing, that's really throwing me. Mm. Um, Other than that, a big part of the game is it's shortcuts that you assign to the D-pad. So you have your gun, you have your various potions, etc., etc. What is bothering me is that you move your character with your left joystick. So I cannot move and shoot at the same time. (laughs) You have to move, stop, shoot. Move, stop, shoot. And (laughs) sometimes some enemies, that's not a luxury you have. So then I end up not having my uh, 
index finger and and uh, middle finger on the trigger buttons like you normally would. So I've got them like curled up so I can hit the D-pad while I'm moving it with my yes. uh, thumb. It's it's not convenient. I would have rather the shortcuts be assigned to the shoulder buttons. You have oh, adopted man. my claw control method, Blue, which I used. <laughs> no, it's a thing. <laughs> it's a patented. Uh... <laughs> I used Christian it claw. in Greedfall because I wanted to shoot my weapon all the time. But also what I primarily used it for is in Dark Souls games. I adopted it when I first played Dark Souls 1 because my problem is that I want impulsive, constant control of the camera as well as my movement. And in Dark Souls, the sprint button is X, so you got to sit there and hold X. But if you want to move the camera, you can't do that while you're sprinting. So I, like... Put my, it's very hard to explain. I put my thumb and middle finger <laughs> on the right analog stick, and then I use my pointer finger to use uh, hit the X button so that I can sprint oh and gosh. have camera control whenever I want. And I played through Sekiro that way, played through Dark Souls 2, 3, most of Bloodborne that way. It makes my wow. hand hurt, but <laughs> it gets the job done. I don't even know I if I can to. physically do wow. that. I bet your fingers are longer than mine. They might be, yeah. I do have longer fingers. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, I was I was curious, but I, I was a little confounded by the fact that the gun is like an item. I wish that that would have been more of just like an attack because it's like a slot in your inventory. The gun, it's a weapon, uh -huh. but you have to like assign it like it's an item. Yeah, but it's far more effective than the, either of your primary or your secondary weapon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it should just be like it should be your primary weapon. Yeah. Um, yeah, in real yeah. life, you would just get rid of your primary weapon and make that your primary <laughs> weapon. <laughs> yeah, I would have the gun as the primary weapon and like a, a sword for a backup if yeah, something exactly. went wrong. But yeah, <laughs> that's what I would do. So um, I don't want to harp on this game too much, but I, there is one more thing that I must mention. The camera in this game <laughs> is killing me. So... Um, I, you know, like Christian said, this is not a big studio. This is not a full triple A game, even though they are charging fifty dollars for it. Um, fifty dollars. So, yeah. So I, I don't. It's not fair to compare it side by side to Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which is only sixty dollars. So if you think about that added value you get for that ten dollar price, holy cow. Um, but this is the easiest way that I can think of to illustrate my point with the camera and Greedfall. So in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, the world feels grounded. It feels stable. And you move the camera and you can look at things. It's smooth. And your character moves smoothly through the world. In Greedfall, the camera is like jiggly and janky and constantly in motion so it gives me the impression of i the character and not moving the cat the world is moving around me if that makes mm. sense because it's when you change direction there's this lurch of the camera and yes i went into the options and i turned the sensitivity all the way down and it's <laughs> not made that much of a difference like when you step out of a room and the door closes behind you, the camera zooms right in like to the back of your head because I guess you're up against the wall and that's where it feels like it's the only space. And then you start moving and it zooms back out. So if you don't pause when you exit a room, it's like in and out. And it's like this crazy jerking feeling. Every time you turn to look at something, it's like the whole world picks itself up and puts itself back down in relation to your new perspective. It's yeah. just, it, it's crazy. And when you run even if you're running in a straight line the camera bounces up and down like the, mm -hmm. the left side will go up and the right side will go down and then it will switch and then it will kind of bounce gently oh, like you're in you're in the ocean and i guess the the it was meant to kind of seem like oh this is what it would look like if you were running but i'm not running <laughs> i'm <laughs> i'm watching the back of somebody's running and so yeah kind of what's happening to me is that the camera is in constant motion. It's this constant visual stress where I never feel grounded. I always feel disoriented. I never seem to really know where I am. And I can only play it for about an hour at a time before I start to get motion sick. Holy cow. Wow. And I've never had a game do this to me before. 
It's crazy. The only game I've had that's given me motion sickness was Amnesia. Oh. I, I don't know if anybody's that. ever played that one. Yeah. No. Yeah, that one messed with me. But so yeah, I could see where you're coming from. Yeah. So I was just like, like the first time it happened, I was like, wait, I I don't feel well. What is even happening to me? Hmm. It's like I just want the game to just be still, just be like still for one minute, but it, it it's not. Wow. Yeah, I, was saying, I didn't uh, have that problem with it. That's weird, Blue. Mm-hmm. Well, I was going to say, I'm glad that I didn't review this game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, see, the thing is, is that um, when I was a kid, I struggled with being carsick. Like, yeah. my whole childhood. Because I always felt like I would have to concentrate because it always felt to me like I was still and the world was moving around me. Mm. And it would make me sick. And so yeah. then I got older and I kind of grew out of it. But this game is bringing back that same kind of sensation where I'm still and the world is moving around me. Interesting. See, I get that way when, like, we're parked and there's a car. Like, if two cars are moving next to you at the same time and you're parked, like, that throws me off. That will make me feel nauseous. Mm-hmm. So I get it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, so that's okay. Only 45 more hours to go. There you go. <laughs> got this blue. There's some yeah. great character building stuff in there, though. I remember I was in the opening area. I specced into charisma because I missed the video games where I could increase my charisma stat. And I was doing those quests in the opening area. And there was a situation where I could just smooth talk my way into what I wanted from the merchant. And he gave it to me. And I was like, yes. Thank you. It was like a euphoric experience. I could create my character to trailblaze my own smooth talking path the way I wanted to in a game that, you know, I haven't had that experience in a similar game in a long time. Fallout 4 didn't even, you know, like scratch that itch for me to such an extent as the Bioware stuff did. And if you like Bioware stuff, I think Greedfall is kind of your in more in your wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to play Greedfall, forget about melee, forget about strength and endurance. Put everything you have into charisma and your firearm and your magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Uh, anything else? That's it. Uh, thanks. What about you, Mike? What have you been playing? So I have uh, been continuing my quest in uh, Tetris 99 to get all of the themes uh, by doing the daily challenges um i've also been going in with the uh, resident evil revelations 2 yeah. continuing that story enjoying it it's so fascinating i have some theories about who the mystery villain is oh it's a mystery so I'll villain. See if I was... well it was well there's there's a voice that appears over your uh um so your characters have these um these bracelets and the bracelets uh monitor their heart rate and if the heart rate gets too fast, they get injected with this with the virus, <laughs> oh, and geez. it either kills them or mutates them. Sounds like a Saw movie. All for the... In- <laughs> yeah. It sounds like Speed, actually. I'm kidding. Did you- oh. oh, okay. <laughs> Which one? The Keanu Reeves one. The one where he's on the bus, and everybody's going to turn into zombies if the bus stops. <laughs> what? You must have saw a different Speed than I did, man. What the heck? So... <laughs> Now I lost my train of thought. What game was I playing? <laughs> um, so I uh, so mystery villain in the game. What's that? Mystery villain. Mystery villain. Yeah. So so I have a mystery. I have an idea who the mystery villain is, but I I'm not sure yet. So I'll let you know when I find out. Um, but one thing I liked about it that started happening in the game is when the mystery villain is talking to you over the um, over the, the over the bracelet in the game. You hear their voice coming out of the little mini speaker on the PS4 controller. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Which is something that like they don't really utilize as <laughs> yeah. much as they should. Like yeah. the last time I saw something cool like that was when I played uh, No More Heroes, and when you would get a call on your cell phone from the um, the head of the assassin organization, her voice you'd yeah. have to put your Wii remote up to your ear. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was kind of cool. That was pretty cool. Yeah, so I liked that. Um, so other than that, I've been playing a game called Super Dodgeball Beats. Mm, yeah, on the PlayStation Four, which is a which is a uh, rhythm game um, set to a dodgeball tournament, where each of your characters you have four characters on your screen, and each of them is represented by one of the buttons on the PS4 controller, 
and um, there's a circle that slowly closes in on the character. And when it hits the character at the right spot, you have to hit that button for them to throw the ball. And um, it goes to a very catchy, very techno soundtrack. Uh, it's interesting. It's it's kind of tough because I'm not, maybe it's me, but I'm not getting the rhythm as much, which I find out because I love rhythm games. Um, and the game is pretty hard because you get, you get power-ups, um, but then so does the other team. So if the other team throws their power-up at you, like, for example, it'll have something uh, like a giant picture that just goes across the screen like an old-school uh, screensaver Whoa. where it just oh, bounces cool. to different spots. <laughs> that's cool. And But that blocks your that mm-hmm. blocks your vision, Yeah. so it throws you off. And the thing is, a, is a game like that that has such a, a fast-paced style of gameplay, and since it's a rhythm game, if you get thrown off on one or two beats, like – you sometimes it takes you a while to get yourself back into it. So, um, so yeah, so I'm still going through that. It's, it's an interesting game. Um, it's interesting so far. I'm not going to give it a, 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 a reply or a, a score just yet, but, um, I got to put some more time into it. So, so is the rhythm though, is it like based off of music then? I mean, is it, yeah. Okay. It's based off music, but it's not licensed music. It's all yeah. original. Okay. Um, but yeah, but you need to listen to the music, and you know what I'll do. You know what I should try doing is I'll pop pop on some headphones and do it. Oh, there you go. That's probably how it's meant to be played. I'm gonna try that. Yeah, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'll be here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, other than that, the only other game that I played is we had our our good conversation last week about uh, the our favorite uh, licensed songs and games. So Mm -hmm. I started getting an itch and I had to scratch it. So I did a little retro hunting and I picked up a game for a game for the GameCube that had uh, another one of my favorite songs. And that was uh, all I want by offspring on the the game crazy taxi. Yes. Oh gosh. That was good music on that game. Yes. So I was, so luckily I was able to find crazy taxi at my local retro shop for like five bucks. (laughs) Yeah. So I picked that up and I played that a little bit, enjoyed it for what it is, a, a quick half an hour, 40 minutes of uh, driving your taxi and picking people up. You played it on... And listening to listening to uh, to Offspring and um, uh, Bad Religion, I think, is the other one. Oh, nice. You got it on GameCube, Mike? Yes, I do. Is the are, are you aware as to whether or not the GameCube and Dreamcast soundtracks are different? No, I'm not aware of any change in the soundtrack. Okay, that's good. Yeah, because the Dreamcast soundtrack's really good too. Yeah. Hmm. Man, now I want to go back and listen to Offspring and Bad Religion, <laughs> <laughs> two other bands that defined me as a <laughs> in my teenage years, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Anything? So, anything else? Nope. That's it. That's all I played. Okay. Uh, what about you, Christian? Uh, I finished Borderlands 3, so I Yay. didn't have much longer to go the last time we were together, but I finished it, uh, my first playthrough at least. I'd like to play it again, because the post game is there, and it is meaty, at least compared to Borderlands 2. You've got a bunch mm. of these ranks that you can get by doing these challenges after you finish the game, and, uh, for every rank you get, you can increase one of your stats for, like, things like reload speed or max health, and for each one of those stats you increase... You gain like a little notch on the skill tree, and then there's some end game skills that you can build your character towards. And there's some very good skills at the bottom of those skill trees that I really want to get. So I'm sure I'm going to be playing it some more, building up my character. There was some glitchiness going on. I played on PC, but I think my understanding is that it's a little unstable on multiple platforms. There was a like the big second to last boss fight. It was good. It was fun. I was having a good time, pumping it full of bullets. Finally killed it after like 20 minutes. And then a cutscene played. And then the cutscene ended, spawned back in. And then I realized that I spawned back in below the map because I looked up and the map was above me. And I was just falling infinitely into this like pink abyss. And so I just kind (laughs) of looked up and watched the game world get smaller and smaller. And I waited 20 minutes for me to like supposedly hit some gap and die eventually. 
And I wasn't dying, so after like 30 minutes, I tried killing myself. I was starting throwing grenades. I was shooting <laughs> rocket launchers. Nothing yep. was happening. Yep. Oh, so I had no. to quit out, jump back in, and it spawned me after the boss died, so that was good. But all the loot was gone, and so oh, no. I missed out on a oh, lot no. of good loot there. But, you know, I, I got over it. I um, I saw a video where somebody was streaming this game, and... Every time the person jumped, like they just kept going up and up and up and up. Like you watch them be a little tiny glitch and then they were gone and they were in space. And then the guy would be like, oh, hey, I'm reaching the sky ceiling. Look what's up here. Like they eventually reached the point where they couldn't go up anymore. And then I guess they there was some button that they pushed and they were able to just come back down. And then so they wait, 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 wait. And here they come all the way back down. Oh, my goodness. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I love those silly ones. The silly ones mm-hmm. are totally okay by me. Not when they're screwing with me and my loot. I am not going to put up with that gear. <laughs> but when they're funny, yes, there's. Uh, they've got the, what is it, the giant slamming you into the ground in Skyrim glitch, where when mm-hmm. Skyrim first launched, whenever a giant hit you with its club, you'd slam into the ground, and then the collision wouldn't know what to do, and the physics would bug out, and you'd go, like, flying super high into the air. <laughs> so sometimes if you shoot someone just right, they'll, like, clip onto the ground and go flying into the air, and it's just infinitely amusing every time it happens <laughs> yeah the particular video that i watched they were doing multiplayer and so they were trying to fight some sort of boss and then the guy who was doing the glitch was just screwing around like <laughs> jumping high and the rest of his team was like yelling at him like quit the party and come back and help us stop it and he's like la 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 fly <laughs> that's so good i love this guy i think oh, playing through borderlands 3 uh, now, having gotten to the end of it, what I have really appreciated is the lack of extremely annoying things. Borderlands 2 is full of annoying enemies, annoying level design, just annoying little things that just nag at me. And they, like, granted, I've played through Borderlands 2 over four times now, so those last two times I was hyper aware of all these moments and sequences that I had to play through where I wasn't going to enjoy it. There's robots that, like, spin their arms so that you can't shoot them except for these very specific spots in Borderlands 2. There are enemies that suck you into wormholes that I'm pretty sure you can't get out of in Borderlands 2, and they're ridiculous. And there's these buzzard helicopter, like, flying things in Borderlands 2 that suck because they have huge health bars and they fly around and they shoot rockets into your face while you're just sitting there trying to shoot them, but they're, like, 50 yards away. And so if you don't have the right weapons, you're just screwed and these things are just progressively killing you throughout the whole time. Those aerial vehicles, non-existent in Borderlands 3. Those wormhole enemies, non-existent in Borderlands 3. Those frustrating level designs where you got a check marker that's like you're right on top of but then you realize it's 50 feet above you and you have to go halfway across the map in order to actually get up there not existent in borderlands 3 very pleased largely frictionless experience for the most part especially when compared to the last main entry wow so you're enjoying it then is that what i'm hearing oh absolutely (laughs) i think i think that's it's that's so huge though because how many great games are there out there that when you are actually honest with yourself are full of annoying things and they don't have to be that way. They don't have to be <laughs> in the game. And if you think about just like the, the pure experience that it would be if those things were just simply removed and then, yeah. then every once in a while you get something like what he's describing with Borderlands 3. And that's, exactly. that's like the Holy Grail. Yeah, it is. That's why I'm excited to jump back into it. And Borderlands 3 is now my favorite main Borderlands entry. My favorite Borderlands game is probably Tales from the Borderlands still. But Borderlands 3, my favorite actual Borderlands game. Nice. Are you looking forward to the Halloween uh, event? I didn't even know there was one, Mike. Yeah. You're more on top of this stuff than I am. Oh, Mike's a journalist. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i read things <laughs> Jeez, mike i'm gonna have to look into this now see when i hear yeah. you talk about the game and in phil uh you know phil hoff who is also part of the show part of the gamer heads podcast he loves the game too ah, i just i want to get it i want to get it so bad but i feel like i have so many other things i need to play you do 
I know. Yeah. I know. And I and I and it will just take away from the things that I need to play. But I really want to play this game. <laughs> <laughs> well, Roger, Borderlands 3 isn't going anywhere. I'm sure in a year they're going to be selling the game of the year edition with all the stuff yep. for 40 bucks for instead of 60. Price, yeah. I I know, but yeah. but I won't get into the holiday uh, the Halloween event. No. Nah, who cares? <laughs> I'll tell you what, Roger. I'll wait as well, okay. and then we could both be at the same skill level oh, when you do get aw. it. Friendship. That's gonna say that's what friends are all about. Mm-hmm. Waiting till your other friend can <laughs> play Borderlands Three with you before yeah. buying it. Mm-hmm. We can buy it, Mike. Just don't play. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that won't be a problem. <laughs> oh, friendship. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Anything else, Chris? I just finished, for review for New Game Network, The Surge 2. So, I just want to interrupt you there. Why did they make a Surge 2? <laughs> Why did they make a second one? Because they didn't had... Think the first one did so well. It did pretty decently, especially for did Deck it? 13. So, okay. I went right. back, I played a little bit of The Surge 1, because I had not played it up until this point. I was like, I gotta do my research. I I always kind of meant to play the Surge one because it's a Souls like game, you know, Dark Souls like, Souls Born like, where you're killing With guns, stuff, right? And it's tough. And uh, Deck Thirteen is the developers, and they made uh, what was it, Lords of the Fallen, which was like almost as much of a Dark Souls ripoff as you can get. And that one was a flop. People didn't like it very much. It was on free for PlayStation Plus in like a year's time, and they just kind of you know left it by the wayside. But then they actually had a meaningfully unique idea with the Surge. I always, like I said, I always meant to kind of get at it. I never did. I never sat down and shelled out the cash and set aside the time to play through it. But I played it a little bit, and I was pleasantly surprised by actually how unique it was and how satisfying the combat was because they actually, like, did their own thing where it's this cyberpunky stuff. There's robots and stuff, and you're like attaching it's they've got this aesthetic down where you're attaching these weird medical metal contraptions to your arms and legs and your face and you're just like strapping junk to you and that's your armor and basically you get more armor by slicing people's appendages off and it's freaking awesome and it's so satisfying because the game like establishes this loop like this endless looting loop where you're not dependent so much on random drops what you're more dependent on is finding an enemy and picking an appendage because you'll pick the interface works very well for telling you, okay, this person has armor on these parts. You target one that they have armor on, and then you're guaranteed a crafting material drop for that armor piece. And then if you get like five arms, you can craft your own arm armor piece. And you've, you know, you've got a meaningful way to keep on getting loot and it's like skill based. So the only thing keeping you from doing it is defeating the enemies and slicing off that body part. So, The Surge 2 is a pretty quick turnaround. And when I was looking at The Surge 1 reviews, it was funny. I think it came out 2017, two years ago now. And uh, a lot of reviews were like, I guess this is a genre now. This is a Souls-like, you know, Souls-born genre. And we're seeing that with The Surge because it's Deck 13's second outing. And The Surge 1 came out a couple months after Neo. So... Those games were hitting in pretty quick succession in that time frame, at least the big ones. So I think The Surge 2 is like a confident statement that, yes, these things are here to stay. And yes, we can still have fun with them because The Surge 2 reinvigorates things with a new setting. So they've had two years off to make this. The engine isn't meaningfully different. The controls are a bit tighter. There's some quality of life improvements. You can switch loadouts so that you don't have to sit there and meticulously do all your armors over and over again and all of your modifications over and over again where you can just swap between loadouts and the setting, instead of being like this factory closed off area, it's more of this open sprawling cityscape, this dystopian city. And it's very like, they got it. They got that tone. They got that feel. They got it all down where you're walking around. There's this giant octopus building that's like your first destination and you have to get underneath its tentacles because that's where the next quest objective is. And the story isn't great, but it gives you plenty of excuses to lop dudes heads off and slap their helmets on yourself. And that's great. They got the gameplay combat loop 
down. The bosses are tough, punishing, but they reward careful timing and careful planning and building yourself up with the armor if you need to. And I had a really great time with the Surge 2, despite the fact that it's largely the Surge 1 again, and it's just like a Souls-like, because there's still interesting things in there, and the setting's really cool. Hmm. You know, I think I think the Surge 1 was a PlayStation Plus game. Yes, and it is available on Game Pass. Yeah, I mean, available on Game Pass, that's right. Uh, so... <sighs> What did you play it on? Did you play it on PlayStation? I played it on PS4, yes. PS4 Pro is what I played it on. The Surge ran very well on PS4 Pro in performance mode because it was at a locked 60, quite stable for the most part. The Surge 2, not so much. It's not very stable yet, which is kind of unfortunate. And doesn't it doesn't look good. great in performance mode either. It targets that 60 frames mark and it hits it for the most part, but screen tearing is a problem. That's when you get like these weird lines when you're moving the camera, those pop up a lot. And also the assets are really muddy when you're in performance mode. But then when you switch to the other mode, then you're sacrificing a solid frame rate and the ability to dodge very nicely and to time your attacks more accurately just to get slightly better visuals is kind of, you know, a horse apiece on that front. But that doesn't make sense to me, because you said that Surge 2 is pretty much Surge 1. Yes. But you would think that they would have improved on... I mean, and I, maybe it's just because it's super early yet, but when does this game release, Christian? It is out. Oh, right it's out now. now. Yes, sir. So why... why <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. You would expect those issues with the first game... But not the second game. Yeah, I think with the second game, they've pushed things uh, technically a little bit. The areas are a little more vast and open. And Was that necessary, do you think? I think it's really cool having those really big, sprawling open areas because it taps into that Dark Souls goodness that a lot of souls boring games don't get right. And even Dark Souls 2 and 3 didn't get right, where you're like playing in these interconnected spaces where you'll go, go off into one section and you'll just follow this one path along and then you find a switch and open a door and boom, you're back to the beginning of the area and you're like, ooh, and you connect two and two together in your brain. And then this like area that was just like this linear path level has now turned into a world just by it folding into itself like that. And that's something that I liked a lot about the level design. But the level design is also scatterbrained in the sense that they wanted to emphasize verticality because this is a city and there's lots of scaffolds and, you know, multiple story buildings. And so when you're running around, you're going to get lost a lot. I mm. definitely got lost for sure. And so there's no real good map either. There's like a loading screen map, but it's trash. It doesn't tell you anything. So you're going to get lost because everything's on top of everything else. But there's those like moments of interconnectedness. They're just gooey, delicious bits of Dark Souls 1 goodness that I miss. And that still lives on in The Surge 2. Yeah, but is that, I mean, <laughs> was it worth it? All that? When, how can you enjoy that if you're having issues with, like, screen tears? <laughs> Roger, you, well, you act like you've never read a book where the first one in a series was really great, and so that they <laughs> rush out all the sequels and they suck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that happens all the time. It happens with books, it happens yeah. with movies, it happens with TV shows and games. <laughs> I know. It just It just seems weird to me. I don't know. It's not a technical mess. I mean, the frame rate was largely solid. It would only really chug when there's a lot of boss stuff happening, a lot of particle effects. This game is definitely more heavy in the particle effects department, thanks to some story stuff that's happening. But, it's, you know, it's the PS4 Pro. It's already old. These consoles are aging. If I played it on my PC, it would run much better. I've kind of accepted it at this point that these consoles can only do so much with multi-platform games that also release on PC. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> you win this round. Yeah, you win. You win, Christian. Uh, That's all I got for you, Roger. Okay. Uh, so for myself, I have been playing some more Link's Awakening. And again, that game is really cute. And I'm enjoying it. It's a good game. It's a good game. You know, one one thing that people have been saying about this game 
was the frame rate issues. Mm-hmm. You know, it, and there was a lot of people saying, ah, I don't want to play this game because of the frame rate issues. And either I am super forgiving or I'm just not catching it. <laughs> maybe, maybe being old, my eyes can't catch the no, I don't know. I don't see any issues. It runs worse than the Surge 2 does on consoles, Roger. I, that's what I... Well, huh. I don't know how it does. It does. It's does. because it's double buffer V-synced. And so what that means is that the game either runs at 60 frames per second or it runs at 30 frames per second. There's no in-between. So it's either going to be like very noticeably slow or it's going to be fine. In... Okay. I guess... I don't know. You know, it's weird because maybe I just don't pay attention to these things and I just don't care. I do know Maybe we're just so used to it. Or maybe that. Maybe that's the issue because I did notice it. I mentioned this before. I mentioned this on a review of uh, Assassin's Creed 3 on the Switch where enemies would pop out of nowhere. Like when you're riding pop on in. your horse, you're like, hey, what? What's it's it's pop in in open world games. Pop in. Usually. Pop in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so I noticed that, and that was kind of annoying, but I haven't noticed any, and maybe you're right, Mike, maybe it's just I'm so used to it that I just don't pay attention to the issues with the frame rate issues. And I know a lot of people said, well, I'm not going to get this game until this is patched, but I don't see any issues. I, I'm, I'm not having any problems with it. And I've beaten the first boss, so I would have thought that I would have seen some issues before getting to the first boss, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. There is one middle game area where there's a lot of water and a lot of enemies in the water where mm. the frame rate definitely takes a hit. Okay. Well, maybe 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 I'll notice it then, but I just it hasn't bothered me. But maybe you're right, Mike. Maybe I'm just so used to playing <laughs> games like Atari games when I was a kid that my We're slow down was so prevalent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you just got used. You know, it's funny because there was one. What game was it? I think it was it was a game that oh it was a game that was on the uh uh Nintendo Switch Online the Super Nintendo games it was the Super Brawl Brothers I've never played uh-huh. that game before but there are parts where that game slows down because of performance chug and I thought to myself do, are they keeping it real based on how it was when the game first came out <laughs> because there's no reason for that now right there shouldn't be. Yeah, for the most part, that slowdown is kept in in order to remain as authentic as possible yeah. to the original experience, which is something yeah. I definitely notice when I'm playing through Mega Man 2, because there's a lot of slowdown in Mega Man 2. But like the only emulated versions, I think, that don't have that slowdown were like the GameCube and PS2 ones that Mike mentioned having. For, for the or the rest of them, like the legacy collections and everything, maintain that slowdown in order to keep that experience as authentic to the original as possible. Hmm. So... Yeah, I don't know. It, I'm enjoying the game very much. And the other game that I will say that I'm enjoying a lot is Sayonara Wild Hearts. I know I talked about it last. Uh, yeah. Week. I'm continuing to play it. And I, in, in between there, I shared some video. And, and Christian, I think you nailed it on the head. I, I, I said racing game, but you you said, oh, it looks like a constant runner. It's a constant runner. That's that's really what it is. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Blue sounds so enthused. That, that, that makes more sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so... there, it, But it's interesting because there's parts where you're, it's third-person perspective and you're, you know, you're, you're const, constantly running or you're racing, right, against enemies. And then the last... One of the last levels I just played was it's first-person. So you're, you're on a motorcycle and you have this... St- your hands are on the steering wheel and you know, you're moving left and right. Uh, the constant runner with that is, it was, it was interesting. I thought it was so fascinating. And then the, the level I just played was really fascinating. The, the, the enemies are the, so, so as you're playing, there's obstacles that are coming in front of you. And I mentioned last time that you're go left to right. And usually there's about three lanes that you can drive in and then you pick up hearts, right? So you try to get the highest score in that level. And the last level I played in, the enemies were like these twins. And every time they snapped their fingers to the music, the, uh, the game would pulse. And then I would see a different visual in front of me. So it would change, it would change what, uh, there might be like a row of hearts in front of me now. I'm like, okay, that's cool. And then they snapped again, but then right 
where those rebel hearts were is now an obstacle. So like they change your your perception of the world or the world around them changes based on their snapping. So they're changing the world. And that made it really, cha- that was kind of challenging. That was a hard game. I had to think, I had to, it was interesting because I had to, at first I was trying to pay attention to what was ahead of me and then try to remember what was there when they snapped their fingers. So when it snapped back, I knew what was there. And I found myself playing the game based on rhythm and moving my character based on their snap and moving it left and right <laughs> based on that. And that actually got me through the level. It was it was yeah. really fascinating. It was so interesting. That's what you want that. in a music game, Roger, is what you want to be able to move based on the music and not solely on the visuals. That's when you like tap yeah. into that musical sense in your brain. That's why I think Thumper is so fantastic too. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so I'm really I'm really liking this game. And I went out to Google Music and I listened to the whole soundtrack <gasps> of the You of double the game. dipped. Oh. I did. It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, I think that's pronounced Lisa Olsen. I think her, is her the artist's name. I th- she's Swedish, I think. Um, so good though. If you if you if you want to listen, if you like music like the Churches or kind of Grimes ish, uh, look at Sayonara Wild Hearts. Look up that album, and and you'd like this music then too. So. There's other games I'm playing that I can't talk about right now, <laughs> which is the reason why I can't play other games <laughs> like like uh, Borderlands Three because I have, you know, these yeah these are these are review duties so I I and they're quite big and I have to play them uh, so I i can't talk about that right now but i will talk about that sometime in october when i can talk about them but those also kept me very very busy right now all right uh before we go let's go around and tell people how they can get a hold of us and blue how can people get a hold of you you can almost always find me on twitter my handle is at writers you and it's spelled with a y so w-r-y and then i also have a website which is writersview.com nice and mike how can people get a hold of you you can find me on Twitter at TC Throwers. You can also find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash TC Throwers. And you can also find the Controller Throwers podcast on iTunes and Google Play. Nice. And Christian, how can people get a hold of you? I'm also on Twitter at Christian Cubs, though. You can read my reviews like the upcoming one for The Surge 2. If you want to hear me say in 1,500 words, game's pretty good <laughs> on newgamenetwork.com. Or else you can also listen to my reviews at gamerheadspodcast.com. Thanks. And listeners, you can always get a hold of us on Twitter. It's probably the easiest way. And that's at Gamerheads PC. Uh, but you can also go to our website as well, GamerheadsPodcast.com, or go to Facebook.com slash Gamerheads Podcast. Or you can also send us an email at info at Gamerheads Podcast as well. And listeners, uh, like I said before, at the top of the show, we do have a Patreon uh, page, I guess. Yeah. And the link of that will be in the show notes. And as I mentioned before, if you want to become a member of the Gamerheads Nation and have your name read on the air like Miguel or Torto and Tim, you can go ahead there and sign up on the page. And for only $5 a month, you too can be part of the Gamerheads Nation and have your name read on the podcast. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And Blue, thank you for joining us this week. You're welcome. And Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. And Christian, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And listeners, thank you so much for listening to the podcast again and all your support. With that, we will talk to you next week. See ya. Adios. Bye. Good night.